Well, good morning. And believe it or not, this is the First Presbyterian Church of Fort Gibson. I know things look a little bit different. We have more microphones and we've got a, a new audio visual system in place. Don't panic. Presbyterians can change. We can make this work. But give us, give us some time to work out all of the kinks, if you will. Uh, several announcements before we begin worship, uh, some of which I knew about before the um, session meeting this morning. Uh, the first one is that right after uh, worship, we will be having a brown bag lunch for anyone who wants to stay in fellowship, and that will be in the annex. Yes, I baked the oatmeal raisin cookies as I was voluntold to do. The choir will practice this Wednesday in the annex at 6 p.m. We're also inviting the choir from the Methodist Church to join us because we're going to be doing some joint anthems during the Christmas season. So if anybody wants to go ahead and start singing Christmas music, come on. We will have Bible study this week on Wednesday at 7 p.m. in the annex, and Lord willing, we will live stream on the church Facebook page as well. Now, a couple of new announcements that did not make the bulletin, and I hope will be in the bulletin next week. We have our congregational meeting to elect officers for the, uh, for the class, the upcoming class, elders and deacons. That will be on October 23rd, October 23rd, right after worship. So please put that on your calendar. And I also have to report that this congregation is very good at keeping secrets because once again, I have been blindsided. But at least this time, I was given a little bit of advance warning. An anniversary celebration for the 25th year anniversary of the pastor's installation. A surprise. A surprise, yes. Well, it was a surprise this morning when I heard about it in the session meeting. Anyway, if you want to celebrate the fact that I've been here for 25 years, uh, November 13 is the day and 2 p.m. is the time in the annex and so that's going to happen so I have been told and the session has approved I keep looking at a particular person who is responsible for all of this but um, 2 p.m. is the time of the of the event <clears throat> 2 p.m. is strategically located I would point out to you all between lunch and supper <clears throat> I will let you all draw your own conclusions as to why that time was chosen. And now let's be called to worship with these words from Psalm 30. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. Let us worship our God as we stand and sing his praise. problems in the world around us, when we look at the pain and the suffering among us, it is so easy for us to doubt your power to help us. It is even easy to doubt your love. But today, fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we might truly trust in you. Let us look to the cross of Christ, the greatest proof of your love for unworthy sinners like us. Let us look to the empty tomb, the greatest proof of your power to give us not only eternal life with you forever, but abundant, victorious resurrection life even now, even in the midst of all our pains and problems. For we come claiming only the merits of Christ, trusting in the sacrifice that he has made for us, 
and offering the prayer that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. And if you would, take up your hymnals. Our responsive reading today comes from the back of the hymnal, selection 632. Selection 632. This comes from John's Gospel and the first epistle of John. And our theme, of course, is the love of God. I'll read the light face print and encourage you all to respond with the bold. Let's read these portions of God's word responsibly. Selection 632. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. We love him because he first loved us. We love him because he first loved us. We don't know why. But God has chosen to set his love on his people. Let's celebrate this good news as we turn in our hymnals to selection 295. I know not why God's wondrous grace was bestowed upon me, but I know who I have trusted. I know whom I have believed. We'll sing all four stanzas of hymn 295, and let us stand to sing.
We have sung the praise of the Lord who has taken the initiative to save us by giving us new life. Let us celebrate what we believe about him using the words of the Apostles' Creed as they are found inside the front cover of your hymnal or in your online order of service. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. need to do a minute for mission today. Um, the great hurricane that hit uh, Fort Myers, Florida uh, happened right before our Grand Gulf outing on October the 2nd, so I was not able to give you all the update, uh, and now it's been a week, so I really need to let you know what has happened and how we can help. So uh, this comes from from our denominational website, and it says that members of the two EPC congregations nearest the Florida landfall of Hurricane Ian suffered significant effects from the near Category 5 storm. Mike Jones is the associate pastor of New Hope Presbyterian Church, and that's one of the churches we need to be praying for. You have that in your bulletin. He says, many of our congregation have suffered severe and total loss of home, cars, or property. At this point, I'm not aware of any loss of life or health, but I know some were evacuated by boat at 5 a.m. on Thursday. Now, this, this is a, a week old information. He also noted there was no power, no water, no internet. Most of the roads in his neighborhood were impassable. Uh, Paul DeJong is pastor of the First Presbyterian Church in Fort Myers. That's the second church we need to pray for. He reported on September 30 that everyone appears to be safe and accounted for, but with no power and spotty cell service, I haven't been able to contact everyone, only maybe 10% of our congregants. One who I did talk to had several feet of water in her home. Another elderly lady who lives by herself had five feet of water in her house. Her piano ended up upside down, and her refrigerator was in her living room. Many people lost all their worldly possessions, and their homes will be unlivable for months. Again, we're familiar with this sort of thing. It happened at the time of Hurricane Katrina on the Gulf Coast. Paul went on to report only minor damage to the church property at First Pres. He says the church has a few broken windows, a few leaks here and there, the steeple will need some TLC, he said. He noted that the storm surge stopped about 200 yards from the church building. He says the church sits in a flood zone, but it's very well built by incredibly faithful Christians in the 1950s who recognized that one day a hurricane would come. He added that though the church building was not an official shelter, quite a few homeless people were knocking on the door as the storm approached. We absolutely wouldn't turn them away. We let them in, we fed them, we took care of them as best we could. We held a brief worship service, and of course I spoke on God being our shelter in the storm. One of the men said we gave him the best meal he had had in a long time. I hope we were able to minister to him spiritually as well. 
My biggest job was to try to keep people's spirits up because you could just feel the anxiety. Both De Jong and Jones said their homes received only minor damage. The New Hope Presbyterian Church campus was spared any real damage. Jones added, in my neighborhood, every home sustained some damage, some major, and some minor. Our house has damage, but nothing that can't be fixed. He added that both First and New Hope planned to hold worship services on Sunday. That would have been last Sunday. Though without power for the sound system, I will have to project like Spurgeon back in the day. There will be a lot of needs for months, years, uh, as we all know. But if we want to help, the EPC has set up a domestic emergency relief fund. And they are accepting donations to assist churches in these and other disaster areas. We know this fund works because after the hurricane in South Louisiana last year, our presbytery received funds to help with the rebuilding efforts in that area. So it's a great place to give. We know the money will go where it needs to go. And we have two congregations that will be able to identify and help people in need in the area. So to contribute, you can uh, give to our church and indicate Hurricane Ian relief, or you can give directly online, the epc.org website, go to donate, and then emergency relief funds, domestic emergency relief fund. So let's be in prayer for these brothers and sisters who will be going through some very difficult times in the coming months. And let's prepare our hearts for prayers. We take up our hymnals and we'll turn to selection 232. 232. Our strength is small, but his strength is great, no matter what the storms we face. We'll sing all four stanzas of hymn 232. Let us stand to sing. seated. Jesus paid it all. Even though our strength is small, his is oh so great. So with the confidence of children of God, 
Let us pray. Lord and our God, in the face of hurricanes, in the face of oh so many problems in our lives, we confess that our strength is small. Lord, we can't stop the winds from blowing and we can't stop all kinds of storms from coming through our lives, but you can. And we thank you, Lord, that you have demonstrated your love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Lord, we cannot doubt your love when we look at the cross. We cannot doubt your power when we look at the empty tomb. And we thank you that you have allowed us by the perfect and complete work of Jesus Christ to do what we're doing now, to come into the very presence of the Creator of all things, asking you to bless us, Lord, to bless our loved ones, to bless those who are in need. And we can be confident that you hear us and that you will do everything that is necessary to bring you glory and to do us good. And so, Lord, we want to pray this day for those whose lives were upended by Hurricane Ian. We pray especially for the members of New Hope Presbyterian Church and First Presbyterian Church in Fort Myers, Florida. Lord, we ask that you would hold them close to you, that you would comfort them, that you would give them strength and endurance as they face lack of power, as they face difficulty finding contractors, as they face difficulty getting insurance claims settled and all the frustrations that, that go along with trying to get things back to normal. Lord, we ask that you would be a very present help to these dear saints in their time of trouble. Lord, we pray that you would give us the opportunity to help with our prayers, with our gifts, with our time. Lord, we ask that you would bless and encourage those who don't know you in the midst of these storms. Lord, we pray that you would allow the obvious revelation of their weakness to give them an opportunity to draw close to you, the one who is strong. And Lord, we would be bold to pray the same thing for ourselves. No matter what storms are raging through our lives now, whether it be sickness or grief, whether it be despair or discouragement, loneliness, whether it be fear or frustration, Lord, show us our weakness. And in our weakness, let us turn to you. Sanctify our sufferings to us that we might be drawn closer to Christ, that we might depend upon Him ever more completely. And Lord, as we trust in Him, and as we go through difficult times, and as you comfort and strengthen us in the midst of those times, give us opportunities to turn and to share that comfort and that strength and that hope with others who need you just as much as we do. Lord, we pray that you would open our eyes, that we might see Christ more clearly, open our ears, that we might hear his word, that we might understand what he has to say to us, open our hearts to receive what you have to say to us in your word today, and then open our mouths to share the good news with those who need to know Christ or who need to know him better. And we offer this prayer in his name and for his sake. Amen.
We have two scripture readings today, one from the beginning of the Old Testament and one from the end of the Old Testament. First, we turn to Genesis chapter 25, and we need to have this passage before us because Malachi is going to talk about the two men we meet in this passage today. He's going to tell us about Jacob and Esau, so we need to know a little bit about them. And then we'll turn to Malachi's prophecy and see what he has to say about them and God's relationship to them. Genesis 25, beginning with verse 19 and reading through verse 34. This is the word of the Lord. And these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begat Isaac. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Paddan Aram, the sister to Laban, the Syrian. And Isaac entreated the Lord, prayed to the Lord for his wife, because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah his wife conceived. And the children struggled together within her. And she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, shall be born of you. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb, and the first came out red all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. After that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was threescore years old, sixty years old, when she bare them. And the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field. And Jacob was a plain man, dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau, because he did eat of his venison. But Rebekah loved Jacob. And Jacob sawed pottage, he made a stew. And Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. Edom means red. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die. What profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he swore unto him. And he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, lentil stew. And he did eat and drink, and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. And now we turn to the end of the Old Testament. So go to Matthew's Gospel and turn back about one page. And you will find the prophet Malachi, the last prophet before the coming of Christ or rather, before the coming of John the Baptist. We'll just read the first five verses of Malachi's prophecy, and I think you'll see why we needed to read that story about Jacob and Esau. Malachi chapter 1, the verses 1 through 5, this is the word of the Lord. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, wherein? Hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom, that's what the descendants of Esau are called, whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down. And they shall call them the border of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. And your eyes shall see, and ye shall say, the Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. That is God's word. May he add his blessing to us as we begin a study of the prophecy of Malachi today. 
Now, during our study of the first part of Ecclesiastes, we saw how empty life can be for those who have a purely worldly perspective. We saw that for those who live only for the things under the sun, life is inherently frustrating because nothing in this world lasts forever, not even life itself. It's only when God comes into the picture that everything starts to make sense. That's what we learned from Ecclesiastes, but that is not to say that the people of God have everything figured out. In fact, the more we know about God, the more questions we often have about Him. For if God really is all-powerful, if God really is in control of everything that happens, why do we have hurricanes? Why do we have droughts? Why do we have pandemics? If God really loves us, why is there so much suffering in the world? Maybe you've wondered about that. I know I have. But we aren't the only generation of God's people to have such questions. For example, think about the folks who first heard Malachi's prophecy around 400 years before the coming of Christ. Yes, they had been allowed to return to the promised land from their exile in Babylon. But they were no longer an independent people. They had been incorporated into the Persian Empire. Instead of having a descendant of David to rule over them, they had to obey laws that were made up by unbelieving foreigners. And, of course, they had to pay the taxes those foreigners levied on them. So it's no wonder, is it, as we see in verse 2, they wondered, How, wherein, have you loved us, God? Maybe you've looked at the problems in your life. Maybe you've looked at the problems in the world around you, and maybe you wonder the same thing. God, how have you loved me? Maybe you just don't see how a loving God could allow you or your loved ones to endure sickness or sadness or grief or loss. But God's answer to his people's question may be more unsettling than the question itself. What does he say? I have loved Jacob, and I have hated Esau. Well, how does that clear things up? We've read the story about Jacob and Esau. We know they were the children of Isaac, the grandchildren of Abraham. We know they weren't just brothers. They were twins. And we know that Esau was the firstborn. So even if he did turn out to be something of a blockhead... We know that the blessings of God, the the covenant promises that God had first made to Abraham and then to Isaac, that those rightfully belong to him as his birthright. So why was God so hard on Esau? Why did God say that he hated Esau? Well, given the story we just read from Genesis, we might say we understand it obviously. God blamed Esau for what he did. Esau sold his birthright to his little brother for a bowl of lentil stew. He obviously despised the covenant promises of God. Surely, surely God chose Jacob and loved Jacob because Esau despised the things of God. Jacob was thus somehow more worthy to be blessed. Well, that all makes sense, right? except for the fact that we saw God chose Jacob before the twins were even born. Remember, he said to Rebekah, the older shall serve the younger. So even if Esau wasn't worthy to receive the covenant promises, how could God's choice have depended on what Esau did or left undone? Well, we might try to make sense of it like this. We might appeal to the fact that God can see into the future. We might say, okay, yeah, God chose Jacob before Jacob was born, but but God made that choice 
because of the actions that he knew Jacob and Esau would take later in their lives. We might, therefore, continue to pin the blame on Esau and give the credit to Jacob. We might believe that God's choice doesn't determine the future, but God's choice only reflects what will eventually happen in the future. And many theologians have come to this conclusion. It does make some sense. It does get God off the hook, right? It makes God seem less arbitrary, less harsh. But there's only one problem with that theory. It doesn't fit the facts. Let's take another look at these two twins. Now Esau may have despised his birthright, and he did. But was Jacob really any more worthy of God's choice than Esau? If we were to read on in Genesis and come to chapter 27, we'd read another story about these twins, a story about how Jacob took advantage of his blind father, how Jacob pretended to be Esau in order to steal the blessing Isaac intended to give his firstborn. Was Jacob really any more virtuous, any more worthy than Esau was? Really? And that wasn't the end of Jacob's story either, was it? He continued to doubt God's promises even after God blessed him with so many children, so many possessions. In fact, Jacob went on to play favorites within his family, just as his father and mother had done. And because Jacob played favorites, he engendered the envy and the hatred among his sons that led Joseph's brothers to sell him into slavery in Egypt. Oh, that Jacob was a real prince. No, if we want to solve the mystery of God's choice, by saying that God looks into the future and determines what he will do because of what we end up doing, we run into the stubborn problem of human nature. For the fact is, Jacob wasn't any more worthy than Esau was, and none of us are worthy of God's choice either. Can any of us honestly say that we love God with all we are, and all we have, that's God's expectation. Can any of us claim that we love our neighbors just as much and in the same way that we love ourselves? Haven't all of us broken God's law of love? Don't all of us deserve to die, to be rejected by the God we have rejected, by our selfishness and our rebellion? No, Jacob was no better than Esau. And we who trust in Jesus are no better than those who continue in unbelief. If God's choice depended on our goodness or our actions, none of us would be saved. And so we see there is absolutely nothing any of us can do to make ourselves worthy of God's love. Oh, but we can try, can't we? Look at the Edomites. Look at the descendants of Esau who are mentioned in verse 4. Just as the Israelites had been carried off into exile in Babylon, verse 3 says that God allowed the enemies of the Edomites to overrun their territory and lay waste to their land. And how did the descendants of Esau respond to this disaster? They said, we are impoverished, but we will return. We will build the desolate places. Now, you have to admire their pluck. They weren't going to let anything get them down. Much as we expect the people of Fort Myers to do, they were determined to better their lot. They were determined to, to do whatever was necessary to restore their fortunes. But where it came to the Edomites... God made it clear in verse 4. No matter how hard they tried to put the pieces of their lives back together, their efforts would do no good. 
Just as was the case with the Israelites, there was nothing they themselves could do to earn God's blessings, to earn God's love. And come to think of it, isn't that the same kind of thing we learned from the book of Ecclesiastes? How helpless we are. Remember Solomon had all the money, all the power he wanted. He tried everything he could think of to find happiness and fulfillment in life, but nothing worked. As long as his perspective was limited to the things under the sun, as long as he was focused only on what he could possess or what he could accomplish in his own strength, well, what did he say? Everything is vain. Everything is empty. Everything is fleeting. Or as God said to Malachi in verse 4, they shall build, but I will throw down. So where does that leave us? If we are completely unworthy of salvation, and if there's nothing any of us can do to earn God's love, if there's nothing any of us can do to escape the inevitable consequences of our sin, well, we might be tempted to fall into the same sort of despair we read about in the book of Ecclesiastes. In the face of all of our problems, we might be tempted to ask the same sort of cynical question God's people asked in verse 2. God, you say you love me, but how can that be true? Given all that we're going through, wherein, in what way have you loved us? But is that the right question to ask? I mean, given the pervasiveness of our sin, given our inability to rid ourselves of sin, perhaps a better response when God says, I have loved you, would not be to ask, how? Perhaps a better response would be, why? Why me? Why have you loved someone like me? I'm no better than Esau, and you rejected him. Why did you decide to love a sinner like Jacob? Why have you chosen to love a sinner like me? Well, even if it doesn't make any sense to us at all, the good news is that God has, in fact, set His love on rebellious, inconstant sinners like Jacob. Rebellious, inconstant sinners like us. And that means that our hope is not based on anything we say or anything we do or anything we leave undone. No, our hope is based on God, on His gracious, unconditional love. The New Testament says, God has proven His love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Malachi put it more succinctly, I have loved you, saith the Lord. And that statement of fact, that sovereign choice of God, that should be enough for us. Oh, but how can we be sure God has chosen us? I mean, what if we were to come to the end of our lives? What if we were to find out, well, we weren't chosen after all? What if, what if we want to follow God, but He has not in fact chosen us to be His people. These questions are often asked by those who reject the idea that God takes the initiative in our salvation, the idea that God chooses whom to love. But such objections forget something about God's love. Because God's love is not only a sovereign love that chooses. God's is also a merciful love that promises. And we see the proof of that kind of love even in this passage from Malachi in verses 1 and 2 and 4 and 5. For in each of those verses we find the covenant name of God. 
Now, we often pronounce that name Yahweh, but we really don't know how to pronounce it because it's represented in most translations by the word Lord in all capital letters. Whenever you see the word Lord in all capital letters in the Bible, it stands for God's covenant name. And that's because God's Old Testament people didn't pronounce his name. They said the Hebrew word for Lord instead. So why does God mention his name so many times in this passage? Because God's covenant name goes along with God's covenant promises. You see, God's name comes from the Hebrew word to be. He told Moses, I am that I am. He told us in the New Testament, he is the God who is and who was and who is to come. Our God is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. So once this, this infinite, this eternal, this unchangeable God makes a promise, you can count on him to keep it. And to whom did God promise this eternal love? Well, Jacob received the covenant promise from his father Isaac, even though he didn't deserve it any more than any of us do. And Isaac received the covenant promise from his father Abraham. Abraham's the one God made the covenant with. And God promised Abraham, God promised that Abraham's seed, that one of his descendants would inherit the land and would become as numerous as the sand on the seashore and the stars in the sky. God told Abraham, in you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. The good news is that Jesus is the seed of Abraham. So when we place our faith in Christ, we not only become one with him, we not only become part of his very body, we also become part of that seed of Abraham. We inherit all the promises God has made to all his people through all the years. So how can we be sure that God loves us? Given the sin all around us, given the sin that is within us, what proof do we have of God's love? Look at his words. Look at what he told Malachi. The first thing he told Malachi, I have loved you. God does not say, I might love you if you measure up. God does not say, well, I might love you if I feel like it. No. God says, I have loved you. God's love is complete. God's covenant love is finished. It is a promise of the infinite, eternal, and unchangeable God. And there is nothing his people can do to add to it and nothing we need to do. And how can we doubt this eternal, this finished, this accomplished, this complete love of God when we look at the cross? For there, at the price of the blood of His own Son, God the Father accomplished all that is necessary for our salvation. What did Jesus say as He died? It is finished. It is paid in full. God has loved us on the cross with the greatest possible love. A love that lays down its life for its beloved in spite of our unworthiness. What did John tell us? We love Him because He first loved us. So for those who are trusting in Christ, there is nothing we have to do to earn the love of God. There is no magic formula we have to say. There is no ritual we need to perform in order to bribe God or coax God into loving us. No, God takes the initiative in our salvation. God loves us first in spite of our sin, in spite of our rebellion against Him. God draws us. God fills us. God renews us. God saves us. 
He does it all. And he does it all for love. I have loved you. That is the unconditional promise our covenant-keeping, everlasting God makes. Yes, to undeserving sinners like Jacob, to undeserving sinners like us. So let us trust him to keep his promise. And let us ask him for the grace to love him in return. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for your covenant promise. Thank you for your love. Thank you that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Lord, we ask that because you have poured out your love upon us, let us love you. Fill us so with the Spirit of Christ that we might love you in the way that you have loved us. Unconditionally, self-sacrificially, completely. For you deserve it. And we pray this in the name of Christ and for his sake. Amen. Let's continue in that spirit of prayer as we take up our hymnals. We'll turn to selection 148, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. We'll sing all four stanzas of this great hymn from Isaac Watts. Let us stand to sing. promise of God. Believe it. And now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.